If you have a Bible, would you turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians and chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15, while you're finding that, let me express personally my appreciation for the opportunity and the privilege of serving you on this occasion. First Corinthians 15 from verse 1. Moreover, brothers, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the Twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brothers at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then, last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Let's pray briefly. O oh, holy God, our fear, we long more of your salvation to know. We long to seek you and to find you. We pray that you would bless us as we attempt to do something of that this afternoon to the praise of the glory of your grace, seeing not so much men as servants of the living God and seeing you as their God, their Saviour, their Lord, their Redeemer. We ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I would like you to hold the passage that we've read in mind as we enter upon an address that may be the equivalent of asking a palsied and weak child to defend an army of mailed giants. If nothing else, that analogy gives you some sense of my attitude in approaching the topic we have before us. Now, with hopefully a little less defensiveness than when the phrase was first used, I feel inclined to say the Puritans are of age and they can speak for themselves. I intend to allow them to do so. I am between the rock of the lecture and the hard place of the sermon. Together we stand between the devil of historical assessment and interpretation and the deep blue sea of enduring and abiding truth. Our topic this afternoon is a thorny one, the perplexities of the Puritans. That is, what are the difficulties which the modern reader and thinker faces in engaging with these pastors and preachers, these thinkers and writers? Or to put it more bluntly, what do we do with the fact that the Puritans are sinners? In answering that question, first of all, we owe the Puritans accuracy. We have to define them. The label is often applied by friend or foe in an attempt to bestow either the holy glow of sanctity or the grim shade of associated guilt. Historically, we situate the Puritans as heirs of the European Reformation and the process of reform in the British Isles. They are predominantly English pastors and preachers of the early to mid 17th century with their congregations. They were primarily those who, from within the Church of England, were committed to its reform, its purification in doctrine and practice, in faith and in life, in accordance with the Scriptures. In England, such men typically, as we heard earlier, found themselves thrust out of the Anglican Communion in 1662 if they had not already distanced themselves. Their principles 
and their practices then formed and informed the non-conformist communities of Presbyterians, independents or Congregationalists, and particular Baptists, and then flowed in certain channels into the 18th and successive centuries. So you can call someone a spiritual successor of the Puritans, while also properly denying that they were themselves a real Puritan. So, accuracy. Secondly, we owe these men integrity. We must distinguish between the reality of Puritan faith and life and its caricatures. Some of those caricatures are unfriendly to the point of nasty, perhaps best known among them being H.L. Mencken's quip that Puritanism consists of the haunting fear that someone, somewhere, might be happy. <laughs> now he goes on, this is interesting to say, that's a fear, he says, it's a Puritan fear born of an envy that wishes to punish those who possess the joy that you lack. One of the childish books of British history in our family library when I was growing up showed a happy 17th century village scene. If I remember correctly, there was a maypole and dancing in the background. In the foreground stood two men in black clothes and capitans, those Puritan hats, glowering under their own personal cloud in a patch of self-generated shadow, their faces suggesting that they had recently eaten something that had badly disagreed with them. <laughs> Aha! From infancy, we know who these Puritans are. The careless caricatures of so-called friends can be almost equally harsh. The joylessness of Puritanism has become almost and falsely proverbial. An inclination to self-examination is dismissed as morbid introspection, and that by perhaps the most navel-gazing generation in the history of the world. The Puritans are typically considered to be crippled by a certain heaviness of spirit. And when we're dealing with them, we have to show integrity. And so thirdly, we have to be honest. We have to face the facts about Puritans and Puritanism and, to some extent, those who went before them and succeeded them, those who are now considered their heirs. We need to be honest about their weaknesses and about their sins, and also honest about their God-given strengths and God-enabled accomplishments. So, being careful about their identity, being clear about the reality, and being honest about their humanity, let us attempt to face these perplexities of the Puritans. We're going to do that under three basic headings. We're going to accept that they were real creatures. We're going to acknowledge that they were real sinners, and we are going to appreciate that they were real servants. And then some comparisons and conclusions. So the Puritans were, and knew themselves to be, real creatures. When we consider them as human beings, we realize that we are dealing with people like us, subject like us to all the frailties and idiosyncrasies of men and women in a fallen world. As we get to know some of these men, our perception of them develops. We need to remember that they do not spring fully formed onto the stage of history. The Puritans did not originally live in the pages of books. They walked the streets. Like us, they grow up they grow older and hopefully they grow wiser. They're born, they mature, they get converted. They change their minds, sometimes often, and sometimes about very significant things. They clarify their thinking as they study God's word, growing in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They go to university, they take their degrees, they learn according to the priorities and the patterns and the principles of their own age. They have friends and families. They move home. They drift. They go into exile. They make alliances and connections. They enjoy political and social influence, and they become political and social outcasts. They differ from one another in many things, some more and some less significant, and sometimes in ways it would make you even wonder whether or not you can really speak of the Puritans as in any way a united body. Their lives are often marked by sickness, weakness, suffering, and grief. They agonize over difficult questions. They're lifted up by their joys, and they are brought low by their sorrows. 
Some of them die young, some old, some very peacefully, some very painfully. They are distinctly people of their own place and time. The Puritans we know and esteem are overwhelmingly male and pale. In fairness, <laughs> in fairness, it would be hard for them to be anything else in 16th and 17th century Britain. To accuse them of something on that basis would be a little like criticizing the Ethiopian for the color of his skin or complaining that the leopard possesses spots. We cannot claim for ourselves that by the grace of God I am what I am and his grace toward me was not in vain, while also implying a divine misjudgment in the providential appointments by which God graced and gifted certain men in a certain place at a certain time for a certain purpose. So as we read them, we get a glimpse into their real humanity. Let me give you uh, an example from one of the better known and more highly esteemed of the Puritans, John Owen, born 1616, died 1683. Now, you may have your own notion of John Owen. You may recognize his face from your brochure. We see our portraits or our sketches, and then we give it color and tone by reading Owen himself. To some of us, he's earnest. To some of us, incisive. To some of us, principled. To some of us, forbidding. To many of us, all of those things. Do we know that Owen entered Oxford University at a young age, even for the period in which he lived? He set out on a course of intense, almost ferocious application to his studies. For several years, he survived on four hours or so of sleep a night, relaxing by indulging in sporting activity and music. He leapt the bar, seems to me he jumped up and down a bit, and he rang bells. Owen later declared that he would be willing to give up his learning in return for the health that he lost gaining it. He also acknowledged that while he was so learning, he was fired by no more than earthly ambition and was seeking worldly academic honor. When he left the university and moved to London, he was struggling with a deep spiritual gloom which had settled upon him in his later years at Oxford. There were outward causes, particular pressures and physical sickness, but it seems that the true cause had become concern for his own state before God. All of this was resolved for Owen when he heard, rather unwillingly, an unknown preacher who in God's kindness dealt with all his major concerns and distresses in one sermon. A bit like you hoping that Joel Beakey would deal with assurance. And some unknown stands up because Dr. Beakey is sick. And the unknown speaks on assurance and everything you've ever needed answered gets answered. Perhaps only a few of us have strolled down the street, and I really do mean the street, in the tiny Essex village of Fordham where a young Owen had his first pastoral charge. We haven't wandered through St. Peter's in Coggeshall, uh, the building where John Owen preached when he began to wrestle into his congregational convictions. But you walk the ground. There's, a, there's an inn just outside St. Peter's in Coggeshall that is old enough that Owen would have thought it was fairly ancient when he walked past it. Owen scaled heights that most of us never will. He was vice-chancellor of Oxford University, where he seems to have been a robust disciplinarian. When a student disregarded strict and repeated instructions with regard to his public speaking, Owen sent in the Beadles, the university officials, to deal with the problem. The student body as a whole thought this was great fun, took it as an opportunity to kick off, and Owen, quote, determined that the authority of the university should not be insolently trampled on, waded in himself, personally got the prime offender by the scruff of the neck, and committed him to the university prison. Apparently ringing bells and leaping bars is good for you. His friends considered him fairly dignified and eloquent but he seems to have had a reputation as something of a, of a dandy. Uh, there's a, I, I won't give you the, the, the quote in the original, uh, but he was accused of being both spectacularly overdressed and underdressed at one and the same time, setting a terrible example to the students at the university. Uh, the, the, the materials in which he dressed, the style that he used, utterly unbecoming a man of his stature. 
Someone else sneered that Owen's hairdo involved as much powder as would discharge eight cannons. <laughs> Later in life, with political agitations abounding, Owen was ministering to a congregation in a place called Stadhampton. In January 1661, days after what was called the Fifth Monarchist Uprising in London, an armed uprising that was intended to usher in the reign of Christ, Owen's congregation was invaded by members of the Oxfordshire militia who discovered and confiscated half a dozen cases of pistols. One wonders, without recommending, endorsing, or suggesting such a course of action, why such a congregation required quite so much weaponry to hand in a time of political unrest. Other details can be added, and they command no smile. Owen and his first wife had 11 children, of whom only one survived into adulthood before predeceasing Owen at a young age. What does that do to the way that you pastor and preach and care for people? Do you know that John Owen loved John Bunyan and his ministry to the extent that he declared himself willing to give up all his learning if he could preach Christ the way the despised tinker did? Or that one of Owen's dying testimonies was, I am leaving the ship of the church in a storm. But while the great pilot is in it, the loss of a poor under rower will be inconsiderable. And you can go and stand by John Owen's very real tomb in Bunhill Fields in London, outside the city walls, just a few steps away from the grave of the esteemed tinker, John Bunyan. That's just a few glimpses of just one man. We don't always have much information about them. Owen almost never referred to himself in his sermons. But even the incidental details of one life among many underscores the real humanity. My point is, if you cut these men, they bleed like the rest of us. Now, most of us encounter the Puritans through their writings. There we also find them very evidently real creatures. Some of the difficulties lie on the surface. We roll our eyes at their wordiness, their clunky language, their extravagant sentences and paragraphs, their bewildering structures, their archaic references, their difficult ideas. <laughs> they could have done with some editing, we chortle. Perhaps never having seen the first drafts of some so-called modern classics. We may even snidely tell people not to worry too much with such outmoded authors and their musty tomes. We imply that they really are beyond us or perhaps even below us. Then, leading others, we trip lightly on to the fluffy recent stuff. But these men have a different mode of approach. They've been trained in a very different school of thought to the most of us. To the modern reader, they can appear to be not so much exhaustive as exhausting experts in splitting hairs. They find and mark subtle distinctions. They offer meticulous classifications. They fill page after page of hefty volumes which terrify both with their physical weight and their page count. Let us be honest. Reading the Puritans can be hard work, both in terms of their very thorough style and their profound and challenging substance. Owen himself warns the reader of his book, The Death of Death and the Death of Christ, in this way. If thou intendest to go any further, I would entreat thee to stay here a little. If thou art, as many in this pretending age, a sign or title gazer, and comest into books as Cato into the theater to go out again, thou hast had thy entertainment farewell. <laughs> you ask any one of the publishers here if they want that as the foreword of their next proposed bestseller. <laughs> now bear in mind that his readers were, for the most part, trained to read this kind of writing. And then consider that some of the writings are fairly lightly edited transcripts of their sermons. Joseph Carroll is alleged, perhaps unfairly, in teaching through Job after over 24 years to have preached his church full and then preached it empty again. That may, that may not be true. Dr. Beakey describes that recently republished work as lengthy, meaty, and timeless. His congregation may have felt the same. <laughs> Apparently... We are not the first to struggle with Puritan preaching. They're real creatures. They don't need us to paint them in unnaturally glowing colors. With regard to their creatureliness, their real humanity, 
We can afford to be honest and straightforward. We allow them to be who, what, where, and when they were. We accept them to be men with a nature like ours, and we expect and demand nothing more. But perhaps more difficult is the fact that the Puritans were real sinners. Now, some seem to struggle to acknowledge this. Others seem to glory in the fact and bring it as a charge against the Puritans as if they've discovered some wonderful new thing about them, or terrible new thing. To begin with, I doubt that there is a single thoughtful person in this room who would align themselves entirely with any one Puritan, let alone imagine that they can carelessly say that they always agree with all the Puritans. Now, from time to time, I'll get a phone call from someone who's looking for, for counsel or encouragement, instruction, assistance of some kind, and I'll, I'll try and find out from them, well, wh where are you at? What kind of influences are there upon you? And I will hear something, and I'm more or less quoting, well, I follow John MacArthur <laughs> and Joel Beakey and Stephen Lawson and Sinclair Ferguson and John Piper and Jeff Thomas. At which point I'm often tempted to ask, and exactly where do you think you're going? <laughs> How far are you going to follow them? And in what respects? Follow those men a little further than the cross of a crucified Christ, and sooner or later you are going to have to decide on some particular paths that you're going to take. Now, I'm not suggesting that these men are or ought to be or are not considered modern Puritans, and I'm not trying to stir up unnecessary debate. What I'm trying to point out is that though such men may be united by certain convictions, reputations, and appreciations that's reflected in a conference like this, in other things they greatly differ. And the same is true of the Puritans. Considered collectively, they didn't even agree with one another about some things, many of those things relatively significant. And that means that some of them must have been wrong about some things. There will be many things in which we both differ from and disagree with particular Puritans or strands of Puritanism or the successors of Puritanism, as much as we might differ from one another about certain things. They got things wrong. Incidentally, so do we. Into this category, we might offer such things as their attitude to governmental authority, both when exercising it and when subject to it. Some of the Puritans were most dangerous when they were in the ascendancy. It was not for nothing that John Milton complained bitterly that new presbyter is but old priest writ large. We wrestle with their notions of liberty and toleration, both political and sometimes physical. We have to face their convictions about ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, with its often strong and sometimes strident and cutting language. We discover difficulties with some of their writing about soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. Richard Baxter's aphorisms of justification was vigorously contested by men like John Owen, a Congregationalist, and Benjamin Keach, a Baptist. A later 18th century Baptist said that reading Baxter was to him like wading through a continent of mud. <laughs> Puritan pneumatology, their doctrine of the Holy Spirit, though largely bounded by certain assumptions, was weighty and not always uniform. Now, when you read the Puritans on the Holy Spirit, bear in mind that the weight and the freight of their language is from a different time and place, and you cannot just compare that with this. At the same time, many of the Puritans spoke in language that would make a charismatic blush about their communion with God, about their relationship to Christ, about the adoration and the almost immediate sweetness and joy of their relationship to their Savior. Puritan eschatology, their doctrine of the last things, could be something of a smorgasbord. We should not only acknowledge their disagreements with one another and with us, we also need to draw attention to the manner in which they carried out those disagreements. At times they were rude, and aggressively so. 
Had many of us lived then, believing what we believe now, some of them, given the opportunity, would have had us at the very least in a jail. I read anti-Baptist invective of a high and harsh degree from men whose other writings thrill my soul. I might have loved to hear Samuel Rutherford's sermons, even if I am relieved not to live in what Samuel Rutherford wanted to be, Samuel Rutherford, Scotland. I'm equally relieved not to have lived in what was actually Samuel Rutherford, Scotland, given the treatment that that godly fellow received as a Christian man and minister. The Puritans were sinners by nature and indeed. If you read the testimony of some of their lives prior to conversion, either for religious bigotry or godless living, you might think of their salvation like something like that of Saul of Tarsus or King Manasseh. And they were sinners after conversion in thought, word, and deed. We see that sometimes lying on the very surface of their lives and their labors. We should not imagine that in their families and friendships, their studies and their pulpits, their desires and their deeds, they were in themselves any less, less natural sinners than we are, though saved by the grace of God in Christ. But they themselves tend to be stunningly honest about sin in itself and their own sin in particular. Ralph Venning in a book written shortly after disease ravaged London in the 1660s, the early part of the, the decade, wrote a book called Sin, the Plague of Plagues. In short, he said, sin is the dare of God's justice, the rape of his mercy, the jeer of his patience, the slight of his power, the contempt of his love, as one writer prettily expresses this ugly thing. We may go on and say it is the upbraiding of his providence, the scoff of his promise, the reproach of his wisdom. The writer quoted who prettily expresses this ugly thing is John Bunyan, who writes elsewhere that sometimes I myself have been in such a strait that I have been almost driven to my wit's ends with the sight and sense of the greatness of my sins. But when Bunyan is able to get a view of God in his mercy, pity, and love, as well as in his holiness and justice, when he sees God revealed in Jesus Christ, then despite, he says, being tempted to doubt and despair, he is able to pray in this way. And this is how Bunyan writes. Lord, here is one of the greatest sinners that ever the ground bare, a sinner against the law and a sinner against the gospel. I have sinned against light and I have sinned against mercy. And now, Lord, the guilt of them breaks my heart. The devil also, he would have me despair, telling, me, or telling of me that thou art so far from hearing my prayers in this my distress that I cannot anger thee the worse than to call upon thee. For, saith he, thou art resolved forever to damn and not to grant me the least of thy favor. Yet, Lord, I would fain, I long to have forgiveness. And thy word, though much may be inferred from it against me, yet it says, if I come unto thee, thou wilt in no wise cast me out. Lord, shall I honor thee most by believing thou canst pardon my sins or by believing thou canst not? Shall I honor thee most by believing thou wilt pardon my sins or by believing thou wilt not? Shall I honor the blood of thy son also by despairing that the virtue thereof is not sufficient or by believing that it is sufficient to purge me from all my blood red and crimson sins? Surely thou that couldst find so much mercy as to pardon Manasseh, Mary Magdalene, the 3,000 murderers, persecuting Paul, murderous and adulterous David and blaspheming Peter, thou that offeredst mercy to Simon Magus, a witch, and didst receive the astrologers and conjurers in the 19th of Acts, thou hast mercy enough for one poor sinner. Lord, set the case. My sins were bigger than all these, and I less deserved mercy than any of these. Yet thou hast said in thy word that he that cometh to thee, thou wilt in no wise cast out. When I grow up, I want to pray like John Bunyan. <laughs> <laughs> he has an almost proverbial, overwhelming sense of personal sin. Now, not everybody writes the way Bunyan writes, but there's no lesser sense of the sinfulness of sin. 
Richard Sibbs was renowned in his own day for sweet godliness. He writes, That which least troubles a natural man doth most of all trouble a true Christian. A natural man is sometimes troubled with the fruit of his corruption and the consequence of guilt and punishment that attend it. Doesn't like the consequences of his sin. But a true-hearted Christian with corruption itself. Or here is Thomas Brooks sounding a note of heartfelt confession. A humble soul sees that he can stay no more from sin than the heart can from panting and the pulse from beating. He sees his heart and life to be fuller of sin than the firmament is of stars, and this keeps him low. He sees that sin is so bred in the bone that till his bones as Joseph's be carried out of the Egypt of this world, it will not out. He every day finds these Jebusites and Canaanites to be as thorns in his eyes and as goads in his sides. He finds sin an ill inmate that will not out till the house fall on the head of it. He's saying, it's not gone till you're dead. As the fretting leprosy in the walls of the house would not out till the house itself were demolished. Though sin and grace were never born together, and though they shall not die together, yet while the believer lives, these two must live together. And this keeps them humble. It's not the language of a theorist. It's not abstract musing. It's language that comes humble and hot from a sin-grieved soul. Or for a more recent example, standing in the stream of Puritan spirituality, Jonathan Edwards There is a body and fountain of sin in the hearts of the godly as well as in others. There is not only some small remains of corruption in them, as there may be a gleaning after an harvest, but there is a body of sin and death so as exceedingly to defile the nature. And therefore the apostle, who was not only a true Christian, but one of the most eminent Christians that ever was in the world, cries out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Instead of being, still Edwards, instead of being but small remains of corruption, there is but a little grace. Corruption is done away no further than grace prevails. As it is with a place that has heretofore been filled with perfect darkness, darkness is done away no further than light prevails. But in the hearts of the godly, there is but a small beam of light, and therefore a great deal of remaining darkness." Is there not more than a hint of irony in the fact that we accuse such men on the one hand of being great sinners and then on the other dismiss such honest and heart-searching confession as some kind of unhealthy spiritual morbidity? Now, at times, such men despite, sinned despite and in the face of Scripture light. They sinned in various ways, some particularly heinous. Now, properly and historically speaking, the Puritans were almost never traders in and owners of slaves, for example. There were a few exceptions there in the 17th century, mainly in connection with what were then the American colonies, bitterly ironic given the hope and appetite for freedom attached to them. Most of the Puritans, when they spoke, spoke against the slave trade. Some expressed a fear that they would be sold into slavery because of their convictions. We do not deny that there were those who might be considered successors of the Puritans who did indulge in some measure in the vileness of the slave trade. If, for example, you go on into the 18th century and read some sermons that were preached by, I, 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 I happen to know the ones by the 18th century Baptists, it's clear that there was more than sufficient light for any man to know at that point the wickedness of so-called chattel slavery. Now, be honest and be fair. It was remarkable under those circumstances that some of those men actually began to treat their slaves with anything like humanity. At the same time, I feel like saying that to assert that there were some nice and kind slave owners is not far from saying that some people murder others very gently. But we don't do our spiritual forefathers any favors by whitewashing their histories, by denying or excusing Martin Luther's anti-Semitism, or George Whitfield's slave owning, for example. If we suggest that because of their historical circumstances, they committed sins in ignorance, it's a nice excuse, isn't it? 
They just didn't know better. They themselves will not use that excuse. We may be inclined to accept that there were certain things which they did that were common in their day. But sin committed in ignorance is no less sin in the mind of a typical Puritan. Richard Sibbs, again, assures us that all sin is either from false principles or ignorance or mindless or unbelief of true. Thomas Brooks is even more blunt. All Christians have their secret sins. Psalm 19.12, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Secret not only to other men, but himself. Even such secret sins as grew from errors which he understood not. It is incident, it belongs inherently to every man to err and then to be ignorant of his errors. Many sins I see in myself, saith he, and more there are which I cannot espy, which I cannot find out. Nay, I think, saith he, that every man's sins do arise beyond his accounts. There is not the best, the wisest, nor the holiest man in the world that can give a full and entire list of his sins. If you and I stand or sit here today and say, I don't know all the sins that I am committing. We don't, we don't even know those sins. To say I'm guilty of sins that I don't even recognize as sin, but they are still sins. There's no excusing of ourselves before God. So if you were to bring a Puritan before the bar of our own imagined justice, and there to charge them with sin of the worst stripe, I think that any one of those whom we esteem might say with sorrow, you do not know the half, and neither do I. That Puritan would say, I don't understand the sin of my own heart. I haven't plumbed its depths. I don't understand just how vile a wretch I really am though I acknowledge myself vile and wretched. They are the first men to point the finger at themselves. Considered individually and collectively, the Puritans were real sinners. They knew it. Accuracy, honesty, and integrity oblige us to acknowledge them to be so. And this may be the point where you're saying, wasn't this meant to be about the Puritans and how great they are? Aren't we just shooting them down in flames? Do we turn from these men with a sneer of disdain? Do we hurl dismissive insults and contemptuous barbs in their direction? If accuracy, integrity, and honesty oblige us to accept that they were real sinners, real creatures rather, they also oblige us to acknowledge that they were real sinners. And the same principles require us with humility to appreciate that these same men were real servants and to learn accordingly. To begin more generally, there is already massive value in interacting with someone whose entire sphere of being is in a different time or place. Such distance often brings with it a healthy shock, a measure of cultural and even spiritual displacement that jars us out of the complacency in which we too often sit. It's, it's what you get when you call a friend from another continent and say, this is what I'm working through, this is what I'm dealing with, this is what I'm wrestling over. And he or she goes, why are you thinking of it like that? What other way is there to think about it? And they tell you, and it's a completely fresh perspective. If you want to put it more positively, here's the assessment of Samuel Davis, president of Princeton University after Jonathan Edwards. I have this on my study door. I have a peaceful study as a refuge from the hurries and noise of the world around me. The venerable dead are waiting in my library to entertain me and relieve me from the nonsense of surviving mortals. The venerable dead make us see things that we otherwise would not, could not see. So many today love to quote C.S. Lewis about reading across the centuries. Every age has its own outlook. It is specially good at seeing certain truths and specially liable to make certain mistakes. 
We all, therefore, need the books that will correct the characteristic mistakes of our own period, and that means the old books. And we hear Lewis, and we nod and murmur in agreement, and yet we are very quick sometimes to accuse or dismiss those who speak to us from across the years. The Puritans help us to identify our own blind spots precisely because they have different ones. Nevertheless, the Puritans at their best are more than mere static points of historical reference. They are shining demonstrations of divine grace and exemplary Christians. First of all, by the Spirit, knowing themselves to be great sinners and drawn by God's mercy to Christ, the Puritans become master repenters. Listen to Thomas Watson speak for them. Oh, that we would, while we are on this side of the grave, make our peace with God. Tomorrow may be our dying day. Let this be our repenting day. How we should imitate the saints of old who embittered their souls and sacrificed their lusts and put on sackcloth in the hope of white robes. There is no rowing to paradise except upon the stream of repenting tears. Constrained by this same divine grace, they are subject to the holy logic of the Apostle Paul in Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The marvel then is not so much that they were sinful creatures of their own time and place, but how often and how far they rose above their own time and place. As regenerate men, they set their minds on things above and not on things of the earth. John Owen described spiritual mindedness as having the mind changed and renewed by a principle of spiritual life and light so as to be continually acted and influenced thereby unto thoughts and meditations of spiritual things from the affections cleaving unto them with delight and satisfaction. One of Richard Sibb's contemporaries, a man called Isaac Walton, had a copy of one of Sibb's books and he wrote a little dedication in the flyleaf which includes the following. Of this blessed man, let this just praise be given. Heaven was in him before he was in heaven. Spiritual mindedness. With their eyes then fixed upon the world which is to come, Puritans lived as those who were bound for eternity. Ralph Venning urged his readers, be as willing to die to sin as Christ was to die for sin and as willing to live to him as he was to die for you. Be as willing to be his, to serve him as that he should be yours to save you. Take Christ on his own terms. Give up yourself wholly to him. And so these were Christians profoundly concerned for the glory of God they were committed to purity of worship. They longed to see the people of God characterized by likeness to Jesus Christ. They relied fervently upon the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Today, so many of us, we know everything that the Holy Spirit isn't and all of the things that he doesn't do. The Puritans loved the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, and they were in communion with them all, delighting in prayer as an expression of soul relationship with God. They exercised a discriminating ministry, that is, they knew how to make distinctions in their congregations between the various spiritual classes and conditions of the people before them. They labored to explain and apply the word of God. They set out to convince and rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and teaching. They were at their best, marked by a peace and a joy which had as its foundation a humble self-forgetfulness and a happy Christ-centeredness. The greatness of God in the Puritan estimation meant that all men, themselves and anybody else, were very small in their own eyes. They wanted to be holy as God was holy. 
and knowing God in Christ as they did, were willing to give themselves body and soul to the pursuit of such a high and holy calling. And many of them did give themselves, suffering even to death, resisting to bloodshed, striving against sin. To read the lives of the Puritans is often to read the lives of those willing to serve God at any cost. You can go back to some of the martyrs of the reign of bloody Queen Mary, to old Hugh Latimer with young Nicholas Ridley, who light a candle with their own bodies, which by the grace of God would not be put out. Many suffered assault, imprisonment, exile, and other persecutions. And if you think, well, that's just the, the, the men in the, in the sights, that's just the, the obvious targets, let me give you a description of the gathered worship of a particular Baptist church during a season of particular distress. On the same 15th of June, 1662, the soldiers came with great fury and rage with their swords drawn to the meeting at Petit France, where they very inhumanely wounded a boy almost to death. It was doubtful whether he would recover it, they took him away that preached and carried him to Newgate, which is one of the, the London prisons, and they never had him before any magistrate where he remained till sessions, until he was brought before the judge, and from there was returned to Newgate again where he yet remains. Human rights. We don't know who the preacher was. We don't know if he survived prison. It wasn't long after that Soldiers came to petty France, full of rage and violence, with their swords drawn. They wounded some and struck others, broke down the gallery and made much spoil. One of the remarkable things is that when they came back, they found a congregation gathered again for the worship of God after the first experience. For many of these believers, such threats and persecutions are not occasional they are the constant backdrop to a life lived before God. During the plague and the fire of London in the 1660s, it was predominantly the Puritans who remained to minister among the dead and dying. Once the fire of 66 had swept through the city, they built great sheds among the ashes of the capital to preach gospel truth to a shattered and shocked populace. Time would fail me to tell, either in broad sweep or particular detail, their sense of the weight of divine majesty, the distinctness with which they called sinners to trust in and follow after Jesus Christ, the earnestness with which they set before men the path to death and the way of life, the clarity with which they painted the paths of righteousness and peace. These things were not a theory to them. By the grace of God, they served and suffered and even died for the sake of Jesus Christ, their Lord and Saviour. They were servants. So we have tried, very briefly and shallowly, to face these perplexities of the Puritans with accuracy, with integrity, and with honesty. We have fallen short. We're scratching the sheen on the surface of the veneer. Nevertheless, let us in Puritan style attempt some applications. Not entirely Puritan style, Otherwise, you would learn to shudder at the phrase 30 secondly. But uh, <laughs> words of instruction, words of rebuke, words of comfort, and words of exhortation. For instruction, consider that we are simply facing facts. We must not lionize. We must not enthrone the Puritans as supernaturals, even where we esteem. Even the apostles spoke of themselves as possessing the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ as a treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Spurgeon put it this way, we might have dreamed that the successful warrior was something different from other men, but when he is brought low, we discern clearly that it was distinguishing grace rather than a distinguished man which is to be seen and wondered at. The man was but an earthen vessel in which God had put his precious treasure, and he makes the earthiness of the vessel manifest that all men may see that the excellency of the power is not of us, but of God. That's eminently true of the Puritans. 
Did they have blind spots? Most assuredly. Some of those blind spots were because they were creatures living in a certain time and place. They did make certain assumptions which were common to the people to whom they belonged. Some of those assumptions were foolish and flawed, ignorant and even ignoble. Some of the blind spots were because they were sinners, men far from perfect in their walk with and service of God. By nature, they fell short of the glory of God. Under grace, they continue to wrestle with remaining sin. Did they see their blind spots? No, by definition, you can't any more than we can. We must remember, though, that they never claimed to be something that they were not. We might even go so far as to suggest that love would do unto them as we might wish to have done to us by others, to take us at our best rather than always at our worst. Should we not at least acknowledge the upward trajectory of their lives and of their labors rather than isolate particular follies and failures? They consistently set out to point away from themselves to God in Christ and where they could see clearly. Not always, but when they could see clearly, they served most courageously. So for rebuke, consider that it might be interesting to have the Puritans sit in judgment on our age in the same way in which we tend to sit in judgment upon theirs. Blind spots? Us? What flawed, casual, foolish, carnal assumptions do you and I make because we are living wherever it is we live in the 21st century? What might a Puritan, if we could for a moment bring one back, say to us about our worldliness as the church of Jesus Christ? What might a Puritan say about our will worship. They often spoke about will worship. That is the instinct, the appetite, the desire and the pursuit of worship that is according to my will rather than God's. What I think God would like rather than what God himself has been pleased to say he desires. What about our laziness? I'm not suggesting you all go away and start sleeping four hours a night and kill yourself in the process. but maybe a little less than we do. Our cowardice, the speed with which we back down when holiness is on the line, our carelessness in the service of the Savior, the way we've got used to shrugging off blasphemy, idolatry, and wickedness, I will suggest to you that we can at least begin to know the answers to some of those questions because we can read them. And they speak to us across the centuries and they jolt us out of the ugly ruts into which we have fallen. Do we see the glory of God as those men did? Have we adored the Trinity as they did? Have we grasped our sin as they did? Have we appreciated divine mercy as they did? Have we rejoiced because of the forgiveness of our sins as they did? Have we considered what it means to be the church, the body of Jesus Christ as they did? Have we wrestled after holiness as they did? Have we learned to fear the Lord as they did? Have we resisted unto bloodshed, striving against sin as many of them? Have we delighted in Christ and had our hearts lifted up toward God as they did? Have we cultivated wisdom to care for souls as they did? Do we search the scriptures to hear the voice of God in the way that they did? My friends, when we engage with the Puritans at their best, we might well consider the fearful arrogance of modernity. And perhaps we splutter, but but these men are not sinless celestials. They're creatures, they're sinners, you said so yourself. My friends, if you can only honour sinless celestials, then the Puritans are not the men for you. And you might as well leave this conference now. Because there's not a single man who will set foot on this platform who is not a feeble creature and a great sinner. There's not a person here who is entitled to mercy. 
You can never claim mercy. Mercy is mercy. Mercy, by definition, is God not dealing with you as you deserve. No one who can look at his accomplishments and say, I deserve all of this. Who makes you to differ? What do you have that you yourself did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? If you're looking for perfect celestials or treating sinful mortals as if they were such, now is the time for us to repent. How that helps us to humble our hearts as well as to temper our criticisms of men both living and dead. The Puritans help us here. They did not simply talk about grace. They lived grace, and they did so humbly. Perhaps some people hate the idea of a conference on the Puritans. I presume not you, because you're here. But (laughs) I think most of the Puritans would have felt the same way, if for different reasons. Why, they might have asked, are you putting on a conference about us? Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory. And that means, brothers and sisters, that we cannot be here to celebrate great men, but rather to acknowledge the greatness of the grace of the God of all grace manifested in Christ toward feeble creatures and wretched sinners. Not so much to talk about distinguished men, as to acknowledge distinguishing grace. In dependence upon God's favor in Christ, the Puritans strove to love the Lord our God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, and with all their strength, and their neighbors as themselves in the teeth of fierce opposition and great suffering. It may be that in some points where we are knowing, they were learning, but perhaps too, where we are coasting, they were contending. Where we are sinning, they were striving. Perhaps then we could afford to be a little slower to sit in comfort and in judgment on men and women of whom the world was not worthy. Then for comfort. Consider how we resolve the perplexities of the Puritans. It is that very principle of divine goodness poured out in the Redeemer. The marvel, you see, is not that these men made any mistakes or committed any sins, but rather that the God of all grace was pleased to draw such straight lines with such crooked sticks. If that were not the case, what hope for any of us? The perplexity of the Puritans is not so much that they were sinners as that God should use such sinners to advance his cause in ways that he did and continues to do. That perplexity... These men were sinners, is resolved only by the grace of God in Christ Jesus. A resolution which remains the only hope that any of us have of any usefulness in this fallen world. My friends, if the Lord could use sinners like this to accomplish what he did in their time and place, can we not hope and pray that God might use sinners like me and you to glorify his name in the same way today? Are you an earthen vessel? then you are qualified, qualified for the grace of God to be in you and the excellency of the power to be seen to be of God and not of men. It never was many wise, never was many great, many mighty. God has always chosen the weak and the foolish and the base things of this world to put to shame the high and the mighty. There is no reason, no reason why God should not raise up greater champions of truth in our own generation. There is no reason why God should not work even among us that we might become more what our forefathers have been and accomplish something of what they, by God's mercy toward them, accomplished personally and congregationally. My friends, there is hope here. Hope that light might shine ever more brightly in the darkness of this present evil age. That saved sinners might become burning and shining lamps 
blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom we shine as lights in the world holding fast the word of life. Is that any less true now than it was when Paul wrote those words? Any less true of us than it was of those who have gone before us? So finally, for exhortation, you've had your instruction, your rebuke, your comfort, Consider now that perhaps the Puritans don't actually need anyone to defend them. They don't need any puny champion. They are men, and they can speak for themselves. The writer to the Hebrews speaks of sinful but saved men in this way. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same, yesterday, today, and forever. Now, can we not do something of that with regard to the Puritans? These servants of God had a faith worth following, and they knew a Christ worth serving. They may have had feet of clay, but if you'll let me mix my metaphors, God gave them foreheads of adamant and hearts of gold. Even feet of clay are lovely, when they bring good news. We are gathered to appreciate the Puritans because we genuinely admire them, not because we unrighteously revere them. We esteem not so much their greatness as the greatness of their God. And if they do not lead us to God, then they would have said, we have missed our mark. And if we are not being led to God, then we have missed ours. The Puritans themselves, even at their best, would never have said, follow me because of me. Their cry would have been apostolic. Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Take them then as they knew themselves to be. Assess them by all means, but at least assess them by their own standard and rest in their identity and in ours. Believing and repenting sinners who seek, despite our sins and failings, and all because of God's grace toward us in his beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to trust him, to love him, and to serve him in our generation before we too fall asleep. Let's pray. O oh God of all grace, God of mighty mercy, loving kindness, holiness, justice, majesty, you and you only are God, the living and true God, and there is no other. We ask our Father that you would give us, not just for others but for ourselves, a view of yourself in Christ Jesus, high and lifted up, Glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, a God who does wonders, and an accurate sense of our own sinfulness and misery and dependence upon you. And, O oh God, as we see you ever more gloriously and ourselves ever more accurately, may there grow in that space between true religion that hisses hot, that is taken up with the glory not of men, but of God, so that we may live and when the time comes, die to the praise of the glory of your grace. In Jesus' name, we plead these mercies. Amen.